from the Monsanto Company. Uh, he grew up uh, in Alabama uh, on a farm where he became interested in agriculture and biotechnology. Uh, he graduated from the University of Alabama in Huntsville, and uh, he got an MBA from uh, Baylor University in Waco, uh, honors each time. Uh, I understand that he's got a, a passionate uh, interest in preserving honeybee health and, in fact, in repopulation of the monarch butterfly. Noble causes, I feel, and uh, being the last president of the Royal Entomological Society, a position that I inherited from Charles Darwin, both myself and Charles Darwin commend that interest, uh, Dion. Now, Dion uh, joined the Monsanto Company about 21 years ago and has been engaged in their global activities. He's now vice president of Global uh, Sustainable Development, and he's going to talk to us today about uh, collaborations for sustainable feed solutions. So let me welcome Dion McGay. So good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be able to share with you over the next few minutes some great collaborations that as a representative of Monsanto, we're certainly very proud to be a part of and share with you as some examples of where we are seeing emerging technologies have real benefits of the moment and certainly into the future in helping societally and developing countries to the theme of today. But before that, first of all, uh, thanks to the GIFTS organization uh, for putting together such an outstanding agenda. Uh, as a non-technical individual, as John uh, represented in my CV, uh, the opportunity to listen to uh, some of the more influential voices and cer certainly some of the more significant scientific research that's being done in the space of agriculture today and to have the opportunity all to join together in a singular focus in how we deliver a more secure food source for a world's population that is certainly growing and unfortunately hungry and malnourished as we speak, only as we can consider what that dilemma can look like moving into the future. And so it's quite an honor, at least to me, uh, a farm boy from Alabama, as John said. I think there's a strategy behind this in the GIFTS uh, organization by using the most obscure accents directly after lunch to keep everyone in the room, to keep everyone in the room engaged. Uh, but, it is, but it is very much uh, obscure from Alabama, I meant completely. Sarah, your accent was beautiful. Uh, and the content. I, I would like to visit more offline and understand even more because it's clearly exciting opportunity in, in the elements of global climate change. Uh, clearly, the impediments that this can present in our industry's ability to provide a secure food source are real and they're paramount. And I think we have the opportunity to talk today more about how we can collaborate to help overcome those. As just a little bit more of a background, thanks for the very warm introduction, John. As he mentioned, I've been with Monsanto about 22 years and before that, I was uh, born and raised in a farm community on a farm. And so agriculture has been a part of, of me, a part of who I am, what I do for a career, for a lifetime now. And I can tell you it's very, very easy for me to get passionate about that. In fact, hard to stand behind a podium and talk about it. Uh, I, I get very emotional as I think about uh, the challenges that face us today and with the challenges, the opportunities that lie before us in the hands of great innovation and great science like that that's represented in the research here in this room. Uh, not very long ago, after about 20 years with Monsanto in, in global commercial type roles where I led sales or marketing, you can already tell that from the tone of my presentation, uh, or moved into looking at our biotechnology pipeline for South America. Uh, I was called not long ago with the opportunity to step into, the, step into a leadership position inside of what we refer to in Monsanto as sustainable development. What that means is that I lead a team of people, a number of them are PhDs, um, where we help establish and define Monsanto's position and the strategies that we endeavor uh, to engage upon to help address environmental, sustainability, and biodiversity type uh, opportunities that face us in our industry today. And as a leader in the industry, we view that not only as an opportunity, we view it as a responsibility. Um, as we look inside this team, uh, I have the opportunity to work in, in the leadership capacity around what our focus is today on global warming and greenhouse gas emissions and carbon released from agricultural practices. And in fact, how we might look to agriculture in the very near future as a key component of the solution 
instead of the causative finger that's being pointed in our direction today. Uh, we also look, as you mentioned, John, very closely at the impact of biodiversity and species and landscapes and the preservation of societal access to genetics. So monarch butterflies and the health of honeybees are critical to what we do as an industry every day. Not necessarily space that Monsanto or even many of our peers have been in for a very, very, for quite a very long time, uh, but a place that has become more apparent daily uh, that the appropriate investments need to be made pro proactively in order to preserve the ecosystems which we rely on to provide food for the world. And so it's an exciting space to be in. I get to work with great people. I get to work on great stuff. I told you I was a farm boy from Alabama. So the tenets of sustainability. Uh, I, I can't hardly imagine who in this room or who live streaming on YouTube couldn't be excited about the premise of improving the yields that feed the world, doing it in a sustainable way that helps conserve the limited resources that we rely on to produce that food, doing it in a societally conscious way such that we are doing no harm to the environment while producing that food and conserving those resources. And as the fourth pillar of sustainable agriculture, doing it in an economically viable way such that those who have chosen the noble pursuit in my mind of providing for the world, the opportunity to sustainably do that year after year in feeding and providing for their families, their communities, and ultimately for the world. And so that's my conviction. You mentioned passion in the introduction, and that's, uh, that's what fuels my fire. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be a voice inside Monsanto and a voice inside the industry that's challenging us to think about sustainability in our sector differently. And I'm, as I said before, honored to be in such great company of the powerful scientific and innovative minds that are in this room that are thinking about that every day and what you do. Uh, I'll give it just a quick start and we'll get to some slides in just a moment, but um, just as a, as a bit of an aside, okay, you read the agenda, I work for Monsanto, you gotta be wondering when does the GMO genetic engineering pitch start, okay? I'm the Monsanto guy that flew here from St. Louis not to talk to you, at least not specifically, about the benefits or the differences in gen genetically engineered, genetically modified versus organic or other productions. We genuinely believe there is a place uh, for agriculture to work together in a more collaborative way. And the conversation is not advanced healthily by saying which one's which, which one's better, which one's different. Instead, how do we all work together to find a better solution? And in fact, if I did fly here with an objective to speak to you about GMOs and genetic engineering and advancements in that innovative science, I couldn't do a better job than what many of you have already done. If you had the opportunity yesterday to hear Dr. Smythe here from the University of Saskatchewan speak, very, very powerful message. If you had the opportunity during the session or in the hallway to share the philosophies around soil science and conservation with uh, Dr. Rattan Lau from the Ohio State University, or certainly last night, uh, if you had the opportunity to listen to Rod Hake, I, I can't tell you anything more. You know, decades of science and 20 years of commercial proven benefit and the conversations we've already been in this week, I can't, I can't tell you anything more. In fact, yesterday, I gotta admit to you, if you listen to Dr., if you listen to Rod Hake last night, if you're like me and you're in the business, and I gotta think most of you are the same, and that fire I'm talking about burning bright, I left here last night, like, stoked. My fire was hot, I don't know about yours. I mean, Rod just had the courage, the opportunity to deliver a message, and he challenged us. If you remember the challenge, at the very end, he asked each and every one of us to find a way to take a stand, to find a way to have a voice that makes a difference. So I'm gonna share a real quick story with you. Since Sarah mentioned the, the celebrity that was in town last night, I'm, I'm one of the group of you that are staying next door at the West End, and my walk back, I'm walking in the clouds last night. I'm just, I watched an individual uh, present about our industry, present about technologies that I've had a hand in helping launch. He even presented about my company in a way that was like, wow. And so I'm on the clouds. I'm just as happy as can be. I'm walking home last night. If you're at the West End, there's two or three tour buses parked out front. And I don't mean shabby little RVs. These are a couple million dollar prevosts. And so I'm paying attention to them as I walk by. And sure enough, as I come around the corner of the last bus to walk towards the entrance, there's a group of, I don't know, nine or 10 young adults, young men, standing in between the tour bus and the door as we're going in. I'm a bit of an outgoing guy. They're all talking, they're in really good spirits. And so as I'm walking beside them, I say, hello, gentlemen, hope you're having a great evening. To my surprise, a young man couldn't have been maybe 20 years old, stepped in front of me and put his hand out and literally shook my hand. He says, why, thanks. I hope you're having a great evening too. 
And he says, it's midnight and you're in a suit. What are you, like the mayor of Saskatoon? <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed and I said, no, no, no. I'm just a farm boy from Alabama. Well, as soon as the word Alabama came out of my mouth, another young man in the group says, roll tide. Okay, I went to the University of Alabama, but I'm a huge Auburn fan. So my response automatically is War Eagle. If you're from the South, football's our life. And that's the way we say hello and goodbye to one another. Roll Tide and War Eagle. It defines your allegiance. And usually you're forced to do that at about three years old. So, so by this guy's greeting, I know right away, I'm all the way to Saskatoon and I'm meeting a neighbor that grew up somewhere near me and went to school somewhere where I went to school. As I shake his hand, a third person, and this is where this gets interesting to you in the room, and I'll quit the ramble, reads my tag. Now remember, midnight, young adults, and his entry statement was, oh, you work for Monsanto. <laughs> now, you don't have to have been in the industry or working for Monsanto for 22 years to know that when a young millennial around midnight who was in a great mood until you walked up says, oh, you work for Monsanto. It's not necessarily the entry into the most beneficial conversation about the great things we're doing in agriculture. My spider senses went off, the alarm bells went off. I said, I've, maybe I go to the door. And I remembered the conversation last night. And I said, you know what? Yeah, I do work for Monsanto. And you ought to hear about some of the great things that the industry I work in are doing to help feed the world. Unbeknownst to me, two or three of them didn't care and walked off their young adults. A couple of them stayed with me, and unbeknownst to me, a few of them are artists in a touring rock star that happens to be in town. We'll leave his Canadian name unmentioned. But they've had a chance to tour around the world. One or two others were iron workers of a very specialized craft who get dispatched into agricultural communities around the world to do very specific iron work and welding and steel work. And so amongst this group of 10 millennial young men around midnight, a good number of them, half, we're on the edge of their toes to hear more about the great things that all of you are doing. Of course, I threw in one or two things about Monsanto. They send me a paycheck, okay? But the excitement from their firsthand perspectives of being in communities like many of you have been in around the world where people are hurting and people are hungry. You wouldn't think at midnight these guys cared about anything except going in and have another beer and talking about the Stanley Cup. Oh, they didn't come to Canada this year. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but they invested 20, 25 minutes of their time to listen to the great things that we're doing in an industry. And that, that's something I think we have to be very proud of. And to Raj challenge last night, I think we've got to be ready to tell that story. It's also something that none of us can do alone. I mentioned part of it was a little bit about Monsanto, but the bigger picture was about what we're doing in agriculture. And that moves to the tone of what I want to visit with you about today in the spirit of collaboration. And the theme of this week's conference is outstanding. The opportunity to mobilize technology in the underdeveloped world. The world has today too many hungry people in it. That base of people are growing rapidly. In fact, we've talked all week and you've seen slide after slide. I can only find a different chart that puts up the same facts that you were aware of before you came and the same facts that motivate you and what you do and what you research every day. The population's growing. Whether you want to say it'll be 9 billion or 10 billion by the year 2050, uh, I'll hedge whichever bet you want, it's growing. That's more mouths to feed. And now, not only is it growing, the economic environment in which it's growing is also very rapidly changing diets, which for now have created the opportunity for us in the agricultural industry to infuse protein sources and meat into diets that have not historically had them. One premise that a guy built like me from Alabama knows is once I've had meat in my diet, ever taking it out is a long shot. I'm not becoming meat free anytime soon. And my guess is an awful lot of society that has infused protein in their diet will now view that as a staple in their daily nutrition. And so as we look at this, how do we meet this opportunistic demand, but do it in a way that is promoting healthier choices, making sure that we are focused on the nourishment of those that otherwise may be malnourished, not just providing food, but providing food that we know can also with it provide health and the opportunity to, to deliver that through healthier choices and do that in an environment where the resources necessary to provide that are more and more scarce, sometimes by our own decisions, year upon year. What we face today in the issues around water quality, what we face today in our ability to freely use nutrients, uh, a number of things are coming under question and coming under fire, and it is difficult today 
to face the risks and constraints that farmers face. Yet, we need to change some behaviors as we move into the future in order to be more sustainable long term. And these impacts are not only on the traditional areas that us in agriculture and my farm father or grandfather would have been cautious of, but now what we see in the trends to global warming, Sarah, they're absolutely true and real. And in a science community like what I'm speaking to today, I know that we all view this as one of the greatest threats to the objective of securing global food supply that has faced mankind in history. Now with that threat again comes the opportunity through collaboration for us also to be a tremendous part of that solution. And so if you use the word collaboration, it will be the theme of the remainder of what I talk about today, because at no point, maybe I'll surprise you in this one, being the fact I do work for Monsanto, and that comes with people's opinions. Certainly someone viewing on YouTube will have an opinion. The day of, here I am to save the day, I'm Monsanto, or fill in the blank with any other name, or I've got the answer, the day's gone. I don't know if it was ever here in the first place, but it is certainly not now. Now is the time for us to put our heads together and understand in the industry what is the needed funding for research? What is the needed opportunities to apply benevolent and governmental funding that's available today in order to make a material difference in, the, in these issues we just talked about that are facing the world? What we need most is collaboration, the opportunity to understand and work together in the delivery of, of, of system-based solutions. At Monsanto, we're very proud of what we bring to the table in those, in those type collaborations. Um, clearly a leader in agriculture and great respect for a number of my competitors who are also represented here on the podium or here in the room this week. Uh, at Monsanto, we spend 1.5, a little more than that, billion per year in agricultural research. You know us as the GMO company. In fact, it's more like about a third of our business globally. In fact, we have vegetable businesses. We sell conventional and non-GMO seeds in parts of the world where GMOs are not today registered. And we are a leading brand provider of seed in most all of those markets, conventional or GMO. And we're proud of the ability to invest richly into the most modern practices in breeding techniques like what our friends from DuPont presented on yesterday in CRISPR technology. Our competitive presence with one another forces this all to be better, and in the end, society wins from that. We welcome it. We are investing aggressively in staying in front of the curve with better performing genetics that are bred with the resistances and tolerances to help in a systematic solution, not be the solution, to help in the solution. And where possible and regulatory approved, we certainly enjoy the opportunity to supplement that with a biotechnology solution or system that helps farmers overcome insects or weeds or other pressures that may prohibit them from optimizing their productivity. And so we take great pride in those as well. And certainly there's no shame if you work at Monsanto about glyphosate and Roundup. In fact, look back over the last 20 years of the adoption of replaced tillage on the back of one single molecule that rates at the highest of the safety ratings of any herbicide used around the world. It's the number one used herbicide reason for a reason, because it's tremendously effective, it's easy for the farmer to use, and it creates an efficiency that's not only good for the farm, it's good for the environment. So we're proud of that. And now the, the whole platform changes a bit as you now look at digital agriculture and how data, even to the smallest degree, meter by meter squares and fields, give us an opportunity to understand better what are the agronomic challenges that that plant is facing at any point in time through the season and what agronomic recommendations might we make collaboratively in order to optimize the performance in that spot on the map. And so all of these things come together with great know-how. Okay, but that sounds now like you've been talking all about Monsanto. We could take our name out and put some of our competitors in. We know these are the tenets of the industry component of what we bring to the table in collaboration. As you think about collaboration, let me give you an example about how we have brought that to the table in Water Efficient Maze for Africa Project. While we have all of these great opportunities, we don't really have the opportunity to sell high technology laden systems approaches into Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa today has over 300 million African farmers often stricken by Delta often stricken by drought, better than 70% of the income used to sustain their families generated from very, very small plots of corn. So while I've got all these wonderful technologies and innovations, 
I've got to find a collaboration opportunity to be able to put some of our genetics and tools to work in these markets. And so as we talk about the water efficiency maze, oh goodness, my mind went blank. As we talk about the water efficiency maze for Africa Project, and I know that already this week, Beth, I see you in the back, and I know that the inspirational conversations that have, we've already shared this week from Africa are so much closer to the issue, to the dilemma, to the answer that what you said outweighs anything that I can say over the next few minutes, and I honor that the highest. What I will tell you is it's a collaborative effort that I'm very proud of. Through the benevolent funding of foundations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Howard G. Buffett Foundation, and USAID, the money has been made available for Monsanto to be able to partner with these benevolent trusts, benevolent foundations, and make available the leading genetics that are adapted for Africa from a global genetic pool where we've selected specifically for the agronomic conditions of five countries in Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Mo Mozambique, and the corn growing components of South Africa. And as we've chosen from these hybrids and worked together with these foundations, we, we still, the best made plans fall apart at execution. We still have to link in a collaboration into the local infrastructure that is Africa's corn business, because it's largely a network of very, very small female farmers who are doing the very best they can to feed a family of five or six off mainly the substance that's growing in the corn in their small plot. And so the ability for us from St. Louis, Missouri to help impact that requires partnership. And so we bring together to the table the African Ag Technology Foundation. Now what this organization does is it takes from us these genetics that have been increased. I'll show you this in just a moment. Actually, I can just go to it now. What it does from us is it takes from us the germplasm and genetics that have been increased. Now we have a very successful hybrid we'll speak about in the end of this part of the presentation. But these technology, uh, these technology derived, not necessarily biotechnology at this point, but these technology derived through modern breeding techniques, global genetic pools to choose very specifically hybrids that can benefit that local market. And then we work with AATF to then deliver those genetics to the small seed companies throughout Africa who can then provide the seed locally to the farmer. But just giving them the seed is nowhere near enough in the definition of a collaboration. We also partner with the, National, uh, with the National Agricultural Research Services, which in essence is the extension or ag science research component of each of the five countries that I named out. And through their national NARS, through their National Ag Research Service, and through complementary work from the International Maize and Weed Improvement Center, we deliver this seed to the farmer with access to very localized recommendations of how and when to plant. How deep should a seed reside? What should the population be in terms of the distance between the next plant? What are the right remediation steps to take uh, in order to try and abate insects? Because as of today, they're only conventional hybrids. And so the collaboration begins to bring in not only foundational funding, not only institutional investment in our innovation, but also the infrastructure that is Africa. We're not just throwing it over the fence and saying, good luck, go have fun. Right? We're building a collaboration that carries not only great products, but tremendous information all the way to the farmer. And in doing that, in the very near future, it paves the way in many of the countries of Africa for the likely onset to complement these maize genetics with GMOs that will help in 2017, we expect the opportunity to deliver the first insect tolerant BT corn uh, to the African farm. And by 2018, the drought tolerance that we are already breeding in will likely be complemented through a biotech approach that we in the past have referred to as drought guard. All of these will be donated to Africa and provided to the seed companies free of a royalty or free of a premium charge so that the farmer today who is growing, when she is growing, hybrids that have well passed their life expectancy, if they're a hybrid at all or a varietal that's being used, the opportunity to try something different. But really what I'd like to do is maybe instead of me talking about it, let you hear about it from someone much, much closer like Beth, but instead we'll use the video. I became a farmer in 1994. Really? There was no rain, there was nothing to eat, and I was having a baby.
plant your maize and the rains are not there, they'll get spoiled and you will lose everything. It is bigger compared to the other local ones. The community are copying the things I'm doing. They always ask, where did you get this seed? I leave this seed, I want to plant it. I work so hard because I have many children. How will they eat? How will they go to school? It is difficult um, to bring them up. <laughs> Maybe what I missed last night when I walked into the Radisson Hotel was that one or two of the people that had a few questions for me last night have seen that in person. And they want to know more. They want to know more what we can be doing about it. I made the assumption that it's one of those conversations. And by being in it, I got a chance to tell that story last night that I'm just as passionate about as the story that I've shared with you today in the collaboration of WEMA. Now let me put a number or two behind why we can be really, really proud of what we're doing. It's early, we're in the infancy of this project. Um, as we look at the very first water efficient hybrid, WE, water efficient, WE 1101. Today, while you see the chart that's represented here, don't hold too close to these comparisons because please recognize before this hybrid, the comparative corns we're looking at were so substandard that on average we were able in these trials to increase yield threefold almost. How? Hybrid vigor and a breeding package that had slightly better, I'd say significantly better than what they had, drought tolerance and disease resistance packages, commercially viable corns, and the agronomic information through the collaboration to put it into the plots and trials and grow it the appropriate way. Let me give you the rest of the story. 367 tons of this seed, royalty and genetic premium free, has been provided today to African corn farmers. That is approximately 36,700 corn farming families. Again, oftentimes the lady in the house that is the farmer and responsible for feeding the five to six in the family. And five to six people times 36,700 farms means that this project in its infancy has already had a significant impact on over a quarter of a million poverty-stricken, underdeveloped African people that otherwise would be scrambling even harder. This didn't answer at all, it's not a silver bullet, but even harder both economically and to sustain. And so I we take an awful lot of pride in what is being done, not because it's Monsanto and here is what we're doing. I take a lot of pride because of what it's doing for society and the chance to partner with key partners to help make this happen in a reality, in a real way. We also look at other approaches. I talked about digital agriculture and then I went and moved and started talking about the developing world and the right answer probably right away is <laughs> yield monitors and satellite imagery and drones. This is not what we're talking about in underdeveloped countries. So where does digitization, where does digital agriculture fit in as we consider the WEMA project or what we're doing in India or the Philippines? And how do we collaborate better to get the right agronomic information at the right time, in the right hands, spoken in the right dialect? Keep in mind, while one country called India has over 100 million small farmers in it, there's countless dialects that oftentimes can't even understand one another in an Indian-based conversation. And so we've invested, based on the need of over 500 million small farmers throughout the world, the one thing that many of you who have traveled into this part of the world have seen and been surprised by was while they're hungry, while they live sometimes in the least of desirable homes and housing, what's, what's not unique? Or what did you find surprising? How many cell phones have you seen if you were on any of these trips? And so the connectivity, not using landline infrastructure, but instead cellular and mobile type technology, gives us an access point all the way to the farmer. And so while over a million small farmers in India, 78% of them have cell phone 
access and, wi and oftentimes even Wi-Fi or data capabilities. So agronomic advice is needed on how to do what they do better. That data needs to be customized and in a local dialect. Since, since the inception of this platform of us collaborating locally for agronomic research and then pushing that out to end users, we've had over 4 million farmers subscribe in India and in the Philippines. And now we will move this same platform to Africa and provide it to the farmers there free of charge. It is not a subscriptive service to create value and us charge for it. Instead, it's a service that helps provide agronomic recommendations locally in a local dialect that helps the farmer make a better decision. It helps track the impacts of weather, how much rain or heat units have been accumulated and what steps might you wanna take as a small farmer in order to optimize the performance in the field. And most importantly, at least what they've fed back to us in market research so far of their experience, is providing of the moment commodity access to information that's allowing the farmer to then market the grain that they've grown in a much more viable way. In fact, the, the studies that we've put in place to see how we're doing says that the farmers using the service are recouping about 20% higher premiums in the sale of their surplus grain than those that are not privy to that information or have yet to subscribe. And so we think there's an opportunity through partnership and collaboration to provide better information to the farmer. In fact, we're touching over a million farmers a day, every single day through texts, uh, through SMS text, through inbound telephone calls to a 1-800 virtual agronomist, and through website information made available for those that do have access to data. And so through those three, we touch more than a million farmers with agronomic information a day and get to collaborate because we can't generate enough local information on our own. Instead, we become a platform to help collaborate and share it through. It's all about putting together science and data. We've talked about this plenty this week, but there's a lot more still to be discussed. It drives to better harvest and advanced uh, in an enhanced environmental conservation. It ultimately protects the footprint of ag. And I could cross that word out. I was taught a new word last week, the footprint of food and the importance of food. And as we think about carbon and carbon footprints, where I will close on our conversation today is in the last area of collaboration, the newest of Monsanto's step forward to say, this is an area we need help. We are actively partnering today with trying to find the path to allow agriculture to become a part of the solution in the sequestration of carbon instead of the today finger that's pointed at us as a 24% emitter of all of the global greenhouse gases currently being emitted, being sourced in agriculture. Are there ways today to look at reduction of tillage all the way to the zero disturbance direct seeding that we do here in Canada, no-till throughout the Americas and South America? How do microbials play into this picture in order to improve soil health, nutrient uptake? How does the system come together that we would say are more carbon smart and drive farming in the direction of being carbon neutral or even into the direction of becoming the carbon solution? I've got a 60 second video and then I'll close with one slide thereafter and be happy to hear any questions you might have. Let's, 60 seconds if I can borrow that time from you. The world's population continues to grow, so does the conversation around climate change. But what is it exactly? What role does an industry like agriculture play in it? Who is already taking steps to address this problem? Give it a minute. Climate change is caused by high levels of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. These gases build up in the atmosphere, trapping the sun's heat. And that's a problem, a problem we all share. Because while we're all affected by climate change, we all contribute to it too, as do many industries, including agriculture. In farming, tillage and the use of resources like fuel and fertilizer emit greenhouse gases. But agriculture can also offset these emissions thanks to crops, which absorb carbon from the air and naturally store it in the soil. In fact, farmers are uniquely positioned to help combat climate change and its impacts, and many are doing just that. Using the right practices and products, farmers can actually help remove as much or more greenhouse gases than they emit. It's called carbon neutral crop production, and it helps make it possible to grow some crops without contributing to climate change. It also improves soil health. And as these practices are adopted throughout agriculture, farmers can help mitigate climate change and its impacts. And that's not just good for farmers, but for all of us. That's a lot to cover in a minute. So if you still have questions, check out discover.monsanto.com. It's a lot to cover in a minute. And I know you were starting to think I was talking fast. Wait <laughs> until you heard what she had to say. Let me close up again with, if I can flip to one more slide here. 
right now I'm starting to play a different video on YouTube. There we go. I'm trying to just go on by that one. We talked, we talked about the theme, of, the theme of this conversation and collaboration to bring emerging innovations. I listed a few here that we've talked about this week. The, in, uh, the influx of biologicals and the changes that we can see in it for soil health and the accomplishment of conservation tillage, the adoption of carbon smart practices, digital agriculture, not just for the big corporate farm as it is perceived to be, and we cherish our relationship in those farm relationships as well, but ultimately in the hands of the small farmer that have the biggest need for these type improvements societally. It's a tremendous pleasure to get the opportunity to highlight some of the great things that are going on. I can speak for my competitors that are represented in the room that they have great things going on in their businesses as well. What I would leave as a takeaway message for those of you who have dedicated your life in the study of agriculture and the science that you've so keenly and precisely shared with us this week, we hear your story and we view our role in this as you move from the technical more into the commercial and the innovation providing into the marketplace. We've got a lot to do, and we're only going to accomplish that through collaborative efforts that allow us to work closer together. Please keep heart, fight the right fight. Continue in the pursuits of the answers that you are pursuing today, because the challenge that lays in front of us is great, and I look very forward to having the opportunity to work with you in delivering it. Thanks for the chance to visit with you today. Nice, Theon. That was lovely. Thank you. Let's have some discussion then, folks. Please, Ruth. Yeah, let me start. Uh, thank you, Dion. Uh, I want to tell you that I'm one of those whose farmers in Western Kenya, uh, almost 50,000 right now, will be using the Wema seed, and uh, it's, make a, it's made a huge difference. For the first time, uh, women farmers, a smallholder, quarter an acre of land, are standing up and saying, Mama, we now are not hungry. And these are people who used to come whenever I arrived and they are begging. And I will tell them begging is so bad, it's so indignifying. They also buy the seed. It's not for free. They are buying the seed, they are buying the input, because they have seen what they can actually harvest. It's so powerful. But also because of traveling, what I've also found out and I bring to my people is that now you have a big harvest, what do you do with it? Where are the weevils? You know, they are coming, they are destroying the maize before you can sell it or before you can keep it for your family. So we got it with Padue, the pick bugs. They're actually keeping the maize even for more than two years and it is very clean. They have never seen such clean maize beyond four months. So it's amazing, this technology. Now I want to thank Morris because this is the first convening I've seen so many people, including the huge companies we all love to hate, actually participating. I, I think it's really, we need to continue with this engagement. And to show that these technologies can also work for smallholder African farmers. My only concern as an NGO on the ground, <coughs> and someone who knows about the value chain, is that you don't give enough funding for actually upscaling and for reaching more farmers. We get peanuts at the bottom. And I know that if I had more money, I could cover the whole of Western Kenya within no time, because farmers already now believe in this technology. So that is one, and I want to appeal to that. And I'm a friend of Monsanto, so just give me one million dollars. <laughs> so that is one, yeah, yeah. Honestly, we have to make a change differently. I don't have too many years ahead of me. I've been in this fight for far too long. The other one is that uh, WEMA was conventional. It was no GMO. That's right. And right now, Kenya, we are on a good path of getting to GMO and trying more technology. My worry is that the minute you say WEMA is conventional and it's the same breath you are putting in GMO and we still have too many countries who are worried about GMO, you are already killing the baby before it even walks. So just let the farmers see yeah. what the WEMA technology, no GMO can do. And then as you come with the subsequent technologies, they can actually see that, yeah, this is actually good and we can accept it and the farmers themselves will be the ones actually demanding. 
So right now, Kenya is in a good place. We can talk about it, and I can tell you I'm a happy person because finally, finally, Kenya can try other technologies, but at the same time, the smallholder farmers have their dignity restored because they are harvesting and they are purchasing. They are not being given for free. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't make me more proud. Thank you for those comments. Uh, I take great pride in being able to even be a small part of some of the successes that you've shared this week and how courageously you've addressed this whole audience about the challenges that you and your community is facing. And I'm proud to have the opportunity to be a part of that solution. So thank you for that very much, Ruth. Yeah, the one million bucks part, I imagine we're going to have to talk another time. Well, but. you know, I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm accused by the press in Britain for working for you guys, and I've never had a cent. <laughs> <laughs> I've, had a, I've had a glass of uh, Raccoon River beer from, Monsanto, uh, from uh, uh, DuPont Pioneer, but, but I haven't had a beer from you guys. <laughs> it's very but, much. Uh, I think Ruth's point is, is, is well made. And, uh, we, we but let me address it. one of one of Ruth's points, because I, I heard it very clear, and I wouldn't want in the shortness of time to uh, seem as if it wasn't heard. I heard you very clearly say we are making wonderful progress in Kenyans are happy and pride is being restored. Do not try to run so fast with GMOs or other pressures that maybe you cause an opposition that slows the success we're enjoying. I heard you very clearly and I think that's something that is uh, local wisdom that we cannot overlook as we make the plans of moving these things forward in the future. Our vision uh, into the next five plus years is that many, many more hybrids abundant with choice are made readily available for you to choose for the optimization of maize growth in your own small holder operation. It's not to choose or push one over another system. 